Heavenly Father, we come before you in prayer just saying thank you, Lord. We thank you so much for once again another opportunity to come before you to break the bread of life, to learn more of you, and to get just that much closer to you, God. So I come before you praying that you would sit me, <clears throat> JR, the man down, God, and that you, O oh sovereign Lord, would rise up big inside of me, using me as your microphone, that you would just send out your word to all your sons and daughters who need a message, God, who really need to hear from you, Lord, like I know we all do. Send forth out your healing word and just let us know through reconfirmation just how much you love us, God, because you never stopped and you never will. It's these things we thank you for. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, Hello, y'all. It's Friday night. It's Bible study. It's been a minute. <clears throat> I've been out sick, but glory be to God, I'm feeling so much better. I want to thank everybody who's been praying for me. It was uh, a rough few weeks, but hey, God is good. We're here. And that actually sets up this Bible study very perfectly. A few weeks ago, when God dropped it in my spirit, I had a particular lesson in mind to give you guys and, you know, one thing after another happened and skip two weeks. Here we are. So with all that being said, this week's lesson is simply entitled It's Already All Right. Now, originally, I was going to call it Everything's Going to Be All Right uh, after the PJ Morton song. But after doing some studying listening to some Yolanda Adams, because that's where I'm getting the name of this lesson from. It just, it really rung out true. Now, I know what you're thinking. It's already all right. Everything is going to be all right. We get that. But do you really? In life, we go through a lot of things. And there are some things that we go through that can be very off-putting. It can be very... I will say detrimental to our mental health. And when some of these things happen, we start to doubt a little bit. We start to lose a little bit of faith. We start to really question, is God there? Like, what you doing, Lord? I'm struggling really bad. I could use a breakthrough. I could use a miracle. I could use a blessing. I could use something. Well, if you've ever felt like that, and I know many of us do more times than we would like to. Well, this is just for you. So with that being said, we will go ahead and get started. And we're going to start by taking a look at Psalms chapter 30, verses 1 through 5, and Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 21. And so <clears throat> the Bible says, I will exalt you, Lord. For you rescued me. You refused to let my enemies triumph over me. O oh Lord, my God, I cried to you for help, and you restored my health. You brought me up from the grave, O oh Lord. You kept me from falling into the pit of death. Sing to the Lord, all you godly ones. Praise his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And then we skip over to Romans chapter 8. Verse 18 says, Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. So as per usual, y'all, we have some things to unpack here, because let me tell you how good God is. First and foremost, we see that and I love to point this out for you guys just to make sure we're all on the same page. It's that you didn't rescue yourself. <clears throat> that self-help book didn't rescue you. Um, your tax refund didn't do it. Your neighbor down the street didn't do it. Mama, daddy, they can't do it. 
uh, all these other false gods under names, they, they can't do it for you. But God, the one true God, whose name is Jesus, he rescued you. Not only did he rescue you, but he refuses to let your enemies, your circumstances, anything in this life to defeat you, to keep you down, to deter you from the course that he himself has personally handcrafted for you to put you on. So when we say everything's going to be all right, we mean that because you can't lose if you're in God's hands. Jesus himself made it very clear to us that there is none stronger than the father. So if you're in his hands, who's going to come against you? If God is for you, as the Bible tells us, then who can stand against you? No one, nothing, nada, zilch. And then we go further and we see that not only will God keep your enemies away from you, but he restores your health. I don't know about the rest of you, <clears throat> but the Bible told me that if we just wait on God, which is a proactive situation for us, if we wait on him, not only will he restore our strength, but see, we mount up on wings like we mount up on wings like eagles. You see what I'm saying? God is so good to us that despite whatever situation we go through, whatever illnesses we may contract, whatever circumstances, whether they be just life being life, a test that God has sent your way to help get you prepared for the next level. Something you've done yourself and gotten yourself into, like a lot of times we do, regardless of what it is, God has your back. God is looking out for you. And you may be wondering, well, what's the prerequisite for all of this? Surely God wants something for me. He does. And it's very simple. He wants you. That's it. He just wants you. You can't pay God money because the money that you have, he allowed you to have it. Everything that's in the earth, the wealth and all the people of it, they belong to him. So he doesn't want that. But like the song Mary, <clears throat> the, the mother who gave birth to our savior, the song she sang pretty much sums it up. What more can I do except give my heart to God? And that's all he wants from you. Your heart, your love. Things you would give to people for less that don't mean any good to you. That's it. So it's all going to be all right. Now, Romans 8 here, it has something very particular that we're going to pick back up when we get to the next junction of scripture. And that thing is, is simply that what we go through now it really means nothing compared to what God has in store for us. You get sick, you're down and out for a little while, you know, a few days, a few weeks, God forbid, a few months, or in drastic cases, some chunks of years out your life. It, it's terrible, you know, it's, it's not a bearable thing on your own, but with God, all things become bearable. I'm not downplaying anything. I'm just letting you know that even the toughest of situations, the things that make you want to literally rip your hair out. God has so much more in store for you and not just in the life to come, but right now, because the blessings that we receive today, tomorrow, God willing, and in the future, they're all from the stockpile of blessings that he has in store just for you. Not the group, but for you. I want you to make this personal because the relationship you share with God, only you can walk that path. No one else can do it for you. So if you want what God has for you, get close to your father. Have an understanding. Have an agreement. I mean, the agreement is is that he died for your sins and all he wants in return is for you to accept the offer because he doesn't want to see you perish. And we're going to get into that. I'm not going to get ahead of myself, God willing, tonight if I can help it. But the point is, is that what you go through, don't worry about it. We already read in Psalms that though trouble 
may endure for the night. Joy always comes in the morning. And though a night to us sometimes may feel like a couple of years or months or days or however long it may be, God always has joy in store for you. Because remember, out of his own mouth, he came to give us life and life more abundantly. And the joy that he gives us, well, the world can't give it and it certainly can't take it away. Why? Because it's inside of God's hands. And that's where you are also. And if you belong to the Father, well, again, what can come against you? It's going to be all right. Trust me. But let's move on. And keep in mind this last part before we move forward. The Bible here in verse 19 says, for all creation is waiting eagerly for the, that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Not just in the grand scheme of if you didn't know they were a Christian, oh, well, guess what? Yes, they are. They actually love the Lord. But no, it, it's, it's a little deeper than that. God showing us what we're really about. See, if you've been with me before, or if you're new your first time, you're about to hear it today, it's that everything that God allows to happen in our lives is to show us where we stand according to his word. Do you really love him? like you say you do? Well, when situations happen in life, when circumstances come, when trials and tribulations occur, you're going to see where you really stand with God because you're either going to respond or you're going to react. Now, if you react, I get it. It happens. We're human. But if your natural state is to react, well, buddy, you've got some work to do. But if you respond, yeah, you lost your job. Yeah, you didn't get paid today. Yeah, you couldn't work. So you don't have what you need to pay the bills. Because typically when stuff is threatened to be taken from us, that's when we get the most on edge. Take a moment. Test your own faith. <clears throat> do I really love my father who said if I need something, all I have to do is ask? Will it really be all right like he told me it would? Can I just trust him? Can I trust his timing? Can I not get caught up in necessarily what I want, but can I just trust the plan that he has in place for my life? Maybe I needed to miss that check so that my faith could grow. But that's a lesson for another day. Anywho, let's move forward. We're going to take a look now at my favorite Bible verse. <clears throat> Jeremiah 29 verses 11 through 14. And then we're going to go back to Romans chapter 8 and look at verses 24 through 28. So the Bible says, for I know. I just want to pause real quick for I know you don't know because we don't know what tomorrow brings. That book doesn't know. Philosophy doesn't know. It's the age old question. But God knows the plans that he has for you, says the Lord, that they are plans for good and not for disaster or not for evil, that they are to give you a future and a hope or an expected end. You have an outcome. In those days when you pray, I will listen. If you look for me wholeheartedly, and that's the catch right there. You need to look for God with everything that you have. Jesus says it when he answers the question of what is the greatest commandment and you will find him. I will be found by you, says the Lord. I will end your captivity and restore your fortunes. I will gather you out of the nations where I sent you and I will bring you home again to your own land. And then in Romans 8, it says we were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't yet have, we must wait patiently and confidently or we have to have faith. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts, knows that the Spirit is saying, what the Spirit is saying, excuse me. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony 
with God's own will. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. So <clears throat> I've never thought to pair these two scriptures together. This is why I thank God when he's talking to me, when I'm studying to help give you guys something that he places in my spirit. Check it out. Not only does God know the plans he has for you, because, of course, he wrote them out. He knows exactly what you should be doing, what you can be doing to where you'll never get bored. You won't want to leave it alone when things get tough. You won't get. Well, of course, we get frustrated, but you won't get frustrated to the point of where you just want to call it a day. It's the kind of frustration to where you just want to push through because you need to see it till the end. God knows exactly what's best for us, not just because he's our parent, but because he's our creator. He made us. Even if you, God forbid, would never give your life to Jesus, he still knows what's best for you. You just miss out. But see, when we choose to grow, that that little seed of faith that God has planted inside of us, when we hear the word of God, when it grows, when it starts to want to multiply and we let God be God in our lives, well, we're in for a treat because then you don't have to rip your head out thinking of what can I do? What would keep my interest? What, what should I be doing with myself? No, just go to God. Father, what is it that you have for me? And he will tell you, trust me, I know. 25, he told me what I needed to be doing, and here I am. And I'm not sick of it. I'm not tired of it. I want to keep doing it day in, day out. And when you do that, well, you realize that, hey, God really does have plans for me, that they're for good and not for evil, that he has an expected end for me, that he wants to give me hope, a confident hope that resides only in Christ Jesus, not in the world, not in your paycheck, but in God alone. And then when you pair that with the simple fact that God works out all things for our good, for those of us who love him and are called according to his purpose, the purpose is the plan that he has in place for your life. And once you get with the program, well, guess what? Things just work out. If again, if you're new here, we have a term in this Bible study called God math. It's just God's unmerited favor that we don't deserve. And those numbers get to crunching and the math just makes sense. Then God will make anything work out for you because favor says, I don't care if you're not qualified. I want you there because I love you. And frankly, you need to be there. Not just for you, but for other people. Because everything that we get in our relationship with God, it's not just for us. It's to help the brotherhood. It's to help the family. We're one big family, y'all. And we should be a lot happier than what we are in most cases. But again, different story, different day. But the point is, is that everything you learn is to help you become more empathetic to your brothers and sisters. I get it. Sometimes. We feel like others shouldn't be making certain mistakes at certain junctions in their lives, but we all grow differently. And because God is patient with us and works on us with, at our level, let's return the favor. Let's be patient with one another. None of us are perfect and we won't be as long as we're here on this planet. Until we pass and cross that River Jordan, as the older people like to say, and get our new glorified bodies. We got problems, y'all. Remember that all of us, none of us are exempt. But I thank God for Jesus who chose to live this life just like you and for me so that everything could be all right because we messed up. We sold ourselves out. We we fumbled the bag, but God went, got it back for us, dusted us off, gave us a bath, taught us how to speak properly. Instead of just slaying Ebonics and put us back on the right path by becoming the path for us to walk and then being the example of how the path should be walked and then being the help 
to get us along the path. He's everything, the way, the truth, the life, the light of the world. Quite literally, you're everything. You can't be God. And there's so much here that we could break down. But so we can move forward and get through this in a timely fashion. The best part is, is that even when you don't know what to do, even after getting your plan from God, the Holy Spirit, your advocate, your comforter, your teacher, your reminder, your confidant, your everything, because that's that's just God. That's his will incarnate. He's right there with you every step of the way, interceding for you back to the throne room to our great high priest who understands exactly what we're going through y'all because he's been there done that and even if he didn't he's God he knows it all but he did it to be relatable for you and for me so that when we're stuck when we're confused when we're angry because we keep making the same mistake over and over again he's right there interceding on your behalf So even when you don't know what to pray for, it's going to be all right. Now, remember, that's the theme of this message. So moving forward, we take a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. And the Bible says, And therefore, since God in his mercy has given us this new way, we never give up. We reject all shameful deeds and underhanded methods. We don't try to trick anyone or distort the word of God. We tell the truth before God and all who are honest know this. If the good news or the gospel we preach is hidden behind a veil, it is hidden only from people who are perishing. Please keep that in mind. Satan, that old serpent who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God or the consubstantiality. There's that word again. You see, we don't go around preaching about ourselves. We preach a that Jesus Christ is Lord, and we ourselves are your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let there be light in the darkness, has made this light shine in our hearts, so we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. We now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God, not from ourselves. Let me repeat that. It makes it clear that everything that we are capable of doing has nothing to do with us, but it all stems from God, who is the source. We are pressed on every side under troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. Yes, we live under constant danger of death because we serve Jesus so that the life of Jesus will be evident in our dying bodies. So we live in the face of death. But this has resulted in eternal life for you. Now, there's something big here I want to break down for you. If you're new, you probably never heard it, but you will today. If you've been with me for a while, we've broken this down to the gristle. But here we go. Verse four says that Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. Wait a minute. I thought God was in control of the world. He is. So why does the Bible contradict itself and say that Satan is the God of this world? Let me help you out, friend. Thanks for asking. Originally, 
when God created us humanity, we had this thing called dominion and power. And that gave us the authority to flex control over everything that was in the food chain. There's man, there's animal and nature. And God put us in control. But see, when that old serpent slithered in the garden and deceived us, I'm not saying Eve because Satan deceived humanity. We we all had a part to play because if it would have been you or me in the garden, we would have did the same thing. Doesn't matter the time frame it would have happened. But the point is, is that we were deceived and we sold out our birthright. And so dominion and power, which was originally ours, was transferred to Satan. And now he has control. But here we go. The first Adam messed up. But the second Adam, whose name is Jesus, came back and set the record straight. Because a human messed up, a human had to fix it. And since none of us can do it, because we all, frankly, are not worth a dime without God. Well, What did he do? The exact likeness of God in the form of Jesus, the son, the savior, or the consubstantiality of who God is. Made a body for himself, came down and gave it life. And so therefore there was Jesus, the man, the the promised Messiah, like the book of Matthew talks about. But also like the book of John lets us know That was God, y'all, 100%. I get he was a man like you and me, but that was God in a body. How else could he give sight to the blind, walk on water, heal sicknesses that had no cure, give limbs back to people? Like, I mean, that's God right there. Like, you feel me? So he did all of this. And when he took back what we sold out, He rose on the third day. And what did he tell the disciples? All things have been subjugated unto me. And now I charge you in the name, not names, but the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, showing you the oneness of who God is, unified under the name Jesus by which all men should be saved. There is no other name except his name by which we can be saved by. So, you know, I'm just placing you up on your history. And so God does this. And in turn, when we get saved, when we accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, well, dominion and power is returned unto us, but in a new form. Ergo, the Holy Spirit and the connection we share with God. Because now, instead of just cohabitating, we coexist as one. Your spirit, when you get saved, is one with God. And I get it, you still mess up. That's because the body is here. The flesh sucks. But your spirit is no longer valuable. You and God are like this. Y'all are intertwined in such a way it can never be broken, as the book of Romans teaches us. And so, Yes, Satan has a little control, a little bit. He has some sway. But at the end of the day, he loses. The fight is fixed. God won. He upset the greatest lead in NBA history. Satan was leading by 81 and 0. And then what happened? God came down, flipped the table, and now Satan is 0 and 82. He just lost everything. Everything will be all right. Why? Because God has made it so. You can't lose when you're with him. And I get it. People don't want to hear the message. They don't want to get themselves right with God. They don't want to stop sleeping with whoever they sleeping with. Been there, done that. They don't want to stop drinking whatever. Liquor is is, is gross, you know. It'll do the job, but it's nasty. Don't leave that alone. They don't want to get over themselves because they think they're this wonderful thing. But baby, listen, if you think that highly of yourself, you probably quite frankly suck. I'm just going to be honest with you because I love you. But God, he wants you to be awesome. And you become awesome when you accept that you don't know anything. Because true wisdom starts with the fear 
the reverential fear of who God really is. Yes, he's great. Yes, he's kind. Yes, he's sweet. But he's also fair and very scary when he's angry. So don't tick him off. But again, it's all going to be all right because God loves you. And when you accept him and you start to work on yourself, that doesn't mean you're going to be perfect in this lifetime. It just means that you don't settle for mediocrity anymore because that's the biggest trap. You can get comfortable in being a Christian and never grow a day again in your life. Don't do that. God has so much more for you than what's right in front of you because you can't see tomorrow, but God can see the end. And if you want to get to your expected end, we'll walk with him. Don't run ahead of God. Don't fall behind because he won't let you. But walk with him. Just walk with him. It's okay. Growth doesn't feel good. It makes you uncomfortable. But through every step of the storm, guess who's with you? The same God that formed us from dirt. The same God that pulled the other half of humanity out of man's rib. The same God that though we messed up big time, came down in a body like yours and mine to die for you and for me today, countless years ago, so that we too could call him Abba Father. It's going to be all right. Now let's take this home, y'all. Matthew 6, verses 22 through 34. Let's let the Lord himself take us home. Jesus says, Your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if, there's that word, if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is, no one can serve two masters. For you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? Let me ask that again for the worry wart, because I used to be one too. Can all your worries add a single moment, a second, a minute, an hour, a day, a week, a month, a year, can it add any of that to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if, here we go again, God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow. He will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly father already knows all your needs. There's the kicker right there. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. And he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Now, I don't know about y'all, but my grandmother always told me growing up and still to this very day. That whenever you see the red text, whenever God himself is speaking, whether it be the, the black text of the OT, something that God himself specifically said in the New Testament, whenever God speaks, listen to that very carefully. Because y'all, you cling on to the words of the master. Jesus is letting you know straight up, you can't be torn. It's impossible. 
you're going to love me or you're going to hate me. There's no middle ground. If you're new to this Bible study with me, well, then let me turn you on to something. There is no such thing as good people. We're all horrible monsters. But with God, we have a chance to actually be good because with him, we actually are connected to a source that is pleasant. For there is one that is good and his name is Jesus, who is God alone. And unless you're connected to the master, well, you have nothing to make you good. Yes, we do good things, but they usually have some intention behind them. I'm doing this to look good to other people. I did that because I wanted to feel better about myself. I did this so I could call in that favor. See, that's not because you did it out of the goodness of your heart. There's no goodness in there. God is love. And unless you have God in your life, well, there is no love inside of you. Just lust. That's it. There you go. There's another lesson for you. But with God, we are actually capable of doing things out of the goodness of our heart, because now our hearts belong to God, who becomes the source of our everything. So when we help one another, then I did it because I know that's what God would want for you. And since I'm a mirror that's supposed to be reflecting his love, it all bounces back to him. I didn't help you because I wanted to feel good about myself. I helped you because you needed it. And that's what Abba Father would want. I didn't go donate that stuff so that I could write it off on my tax returns or, you know, call in a few favors. I did it because there was a need and I had the resources to do so. And that's what my father told me to do. You see how it works here? So when it comes to everything is going to be all right, what does God himself say? Stop worrying about different things. Does worrying help you? No. Instead, focus on the here and now. What's important today? Am I in right standing with God? Have I offended somebody and I'm just not going apologize because of some stupid pride? Is there something I could be working on? Because I don't know if today's the last day. That's the mindset, y'all. The Bible teaches us that we're like the dew in the morning. Here today and gone in the blink of an eye. Every moment of your life should be numbered and set toward the Lord. Because we don't know if tomorrow will come. I'm not being a downer. I'm being real with you. I want you to be happy. God wants you to be happy. And none of that happens when you're filled with doubt, when you're worried about where the paycheck is coming from, where the money's coming from, if the bills will be paid, if whoever's ailing will recover. You just have faith in God. He even said, why do you have so little faith? Trust him. Has he ever let you down? He may not come exactly when we want him to, but he's always there right on time. So trust God. It's literally going to be all right because he made it to where it can't be wrong. It works out for your good, whether it's the permissive will or you're in his perfect will. It works out because of the favor, the God map, the things we don't deserve, but we get because that's what love is all about. So Heavenly Father, we come before you in prayer saying thank you, Lord. We thank you so much that regardless of what we're going through, what things look like, who's trying to come get us or anything that could make us be filled with doubt, worry, anxiety, strife, anger, anything. We know that it's going to be all right because you've already overcome this life for us, God. You overcame it for me. You overcame it from each of us individually and you overcame it for us collectively as the family of faith. So, God, we just want to say thank you that regardless of what life may look like, we know the end and the end is that we win. And that at the end of it all, when you wrap this all up, the new heaven, the new Jerusalem, our new home will descend straight out of your throne room. And we're going to be right there with you. You're going to be our God. We're going to be your people and vice versa. And we will be with you where you will wipe every single tear away, where there will be no more sorrow, no more pain, no more sickness, no more nothing bad. Just us and you and perfect harmony for the rest of eternity. And God, I thank you for that. 
I also thank you for the simple fact that the blessings that you have for us aren't just for when we pass over, but for right now, God, that if we need a blessing, all we have to do is ask. That if we just keep seeking you wholeheartedly, like the Bible says, well, not only would we find you, but that you would have had everything else unto us, even the things we didn't know we wanted, or especially the things we didn't know we needed. So again, God, we just say thank you. Thank you for all that you've done, that you're doing, and that you're going to do, because you're truly an awesome God. And Lord, if there's someone who doesn't know you the way that we, your babies, know you, will God please put them in a peculiar situation, just like the peculiar people that you've made us out to be, to where their only option is you, Lord, because to live this life without you, I don't want to imagine it. Because even with you, sometimes it's hard, but we thank you because unlike those who don't know you yet, God, we're never alone. And for that, we're eternally grateful. So Heavenly Father, we're going to give your name all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory which you so rightly deserve. It's these things we thank you for. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. Hello, beloved, and thank you so much for stopping by today. It's my prayer that you received something truly beautiful out of today's message, whether it's to keep pressing toward that glorious standard that God has for our lives, or if you aren't a part of the family to come and join us as we celebrate the new life that Jesus has given us. Heavenly Father, we come before you in prayer saying, thank you, Lord. Thank you that despite all that's going on in the world that you are God and you will always be God. We thank you for the sacrifice that your darling son Jesus paid for on that cross called Calvary, Lord. We thank you that now through the shedding of blood, there is a remission for sins and we have a true path to eternal life, God. I pray that all those under the sound of my voice would either be encouraged to keep pressing towards your throne room, God, to receive grace and mercy or to come and join the family so that they can shed off the old and embrace the new. It's these things we thank you for as you continually lead us down the paths of righteousness. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, thank you so much for stopping by. Please don't forget to like, to comment, and to subscribe. As we move forward, remember new content coming at you every Saturday, and it's our prayer that you would be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen.